Okay, we're recording. So this is our uh, empathy circle, uh, and uh, we can just introduce ourselves. I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I've been working for over 10 years on how do we build a more empathic uh, society, uh, create a website, cultureofempathy.com. Uh, have been interviewing hundreds of empathy experts. Those, those, those books right there, two rows of books on empathy, and I've interviewed most of the uh, authors. And now we're holding, uh, doing Empathy Circle in this Empathy Tent uh, project to bring the left and right uh, together. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, okay, well, I'm Aaron. Uh, I go by punk, uh, Reverend Aaron. I um, uh, run a podcast with my partner called Punks for Progress. Um, my, my background is I, um, I've played music, but I've been a, um, a punk rock show promoter for well over uh, about 25 years and um, been a lot of freelance writing and that kind of stuff, but mostly, um, so I, I do a lot of organizing and, um, and uh, you know, street active type of stuff. But, um, and that all kind of coalesces into our YouTube channel. So you get a lot of live music events that we go to. My partner lives um, down south while I live up north. I, I live in Reno, Nevada, but I also spend a lot of time in the Bay Area. That's how I met you guys. Mm -hmm. And um, so like I said, that all just kind of gets dumped into our YouTube channel. And then we also do a roughly a weekly show where we kind of do a recap in the week in politics and whatever type of activities my partner in the in the podcast and myself are involved in that week and that's the weekly what the fuck report so okay well thanks and what's the name of your podcast punks for progress thank you find oh. us on youtube and facebook and twitter and uh yeah okay uh dave i'm dave gottfried i'm uh i'm uh actually i'm a trader i trade commodities and stuff on my computer and I'm an artist and I've been involved with Edwin for the last six to eight months with the empathy tent project going to left right you know conflict events and trying to help people talk to each other you know. okay and uh, so what we want to do here is a uh, structured dialogue. We call it an empathy circle. Uh, so in this process, uh, one person uh, will speak and they select who they speak to. And you can uh, you know, talk about whatever you want. We'll have a topic of how do we get the left and right to talk with each other. Or you can talk about anything you would like. And uh, you select who you want to speak to. And the, uh, as the speaker, you're the active speaker, then the listener uh, periodically reflects back their understanding of what the speaker says to the speaker's satisfaction like yeah you really heard me you really got me or even you even understood me better than I understood myself now that's you get extra points for that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so you, you and then so uh, each person has about five minutes we're gonna time it at least to begin with you know five minutes per person and then as a couple of tips, as the speaker, you want to uh, pause periodically so that uh, the listener can ref you know, have a chance to reflect back. And as, as the listener, if you just feel like you're getting too much to uh, be able to reflect, you can say, ah, stop, let me reflect back what I'm hearing so far. But you're only trying to reflect back, you're not trying to ask questions, you're not trying to support, you're not trying to you know, criticize or anything, it's just how accurately can you reflect back your understanding of what the speaker says? Uh, you'll have five minutes or until you say, I feel heard. You speak for two minutes and say, I'm heard. And then it's the listener's turn then to select who they want to speak to. And the process just continues uh, like that. Uh, for the the hour or so that we're going to be uh, together and this process slows down the dialogue and really allows people to uh, feel heard uh, and can be really useful especially in conflict uh, sort of uh, dialogue so uh, the easiest thing is is just to start uh, and do it and uh, and uh, so actually I will actually start and I'm going to speak to uh, Dave just to sort of model it and uh, I'll also do the timekeeping, which I forgot. Stop. Okay.
Okay. Let me bring up the clock. Put five minutes on it. Five zero zero set and start. Okay, so I'll speak to you, uh, Dave. Um, so a few things. Oh, so our question is: is how can we get the left and right to uh, dialogue uh, together? And uh, for one of the ways of doing that, I think is to have these uh, empathy circles. So I've I've done these uh, circles with the the right and the left, and uh, they've you know worked fairly well, actually. So one of the ways of fostering dialogue is to have a structured dialogue instead of uh, the yelling that we see so much at th these rallies. So you're, you've been trying to figure out how to, we've been trying to figure out how to get the left and right talking to each other. And uh, you've been doing some of it and it's been working pretty well. Yeah. And uh, it helps to do a structured dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I noticed too, I was looking at some of Aaron's uh, videos and so forth, and I think I heard him say that he had been at Occupy uh, Wall Street. Uh, and um, I just wanted to mention that the Empathy Tent was born at Occupy Wall Street uh, in Berkeley. So it was, uh, there was, uh, you know, it was pretty dysfunctional towards the end uh, it, in Berkeley Occupy Wall Street. I took the tent there, set up right there on Martin Luther King uh, Street, near the street. And we were there for two weeks and we offered listening. Uh, we offered circle, kind of a different type of circle process. We had art table and kind of all kinds of different activities. So I was trying to bring an empathic approach uh, to occupy Wall Street, and that was kind of the, the first uh, steps uh, for the tent. So you wanted Aaron to know that, uh, well, you, you, you heard on one of those videos that Aaron had been at Occupy Wall Street. You wanted Aaron to know that uh, that's when the, the Empathy Tent was born at Empathy <laughs> at Occupy Wall Street in Berkeley. You had the tent there for a couple of weeks. You did some listening. You did some uh, circle time, a kind of different kind of circle time. Yeah, it was the last two weeks, and then the, the uh, space was closed down by the police uh, at that time. So, yeah, so we uh, were there trying to, and we still were learning. So we've been learning, you know, since then. I think we have a lot more processes and tools now for fostering dialogue because the space was so dysfunctional and it was just kind of beyond us, you know, to really bring an empathic, you know, transformation there. But I think now we probably could have, I think we have some new tools that we could have uh, turned the space around to mm -hmm. get over. There was so many different conflicts and, you know, it was quite a, quite a mess there towards the end. So you're saying you feel better prepared now. You would have been better prepared for a situation like that now. You have more tools than you had then and it was there was a lot of conflicts and you you weren't really able to have much impact you know? yeah yeah i feel heard thanks okay all right so i'll speak to you aaron okay uh, i've been looking forward to this for a while I, it's taken a long time to get together i don't know why exactly but it's nobody's fault <laughs> um but uh because i really enjoyed our you know the short discussion we had that day after the Confused fascism, and you know when I spent some time looking at your videos, I th think that you're a perfect. You know, we're trying to organize. You know, just you and Joey maybe to start with, but to get a larger group of sort of representatives, where we can maybe get together weekly or every couple of weeks or something to really get something going that goes somewhere. Okay, so. <laughs> I'll have to bumble through this process a little bit. Bear with me. So I, what I hear is that um, you have been looking forward to this conversation for some time. You, you did take the time to go through some of my videos, and there's a lot of it there to have to go through. So appreciate you doing that. And then you saw in there um, my sort of propensity to communicate with people, and um, and coupled with having expressed that when we met at. Uh, 
after the refuse fascism meeting, um, I had expressed my interest. So you've been keen to remember that and took some time to get here, but here we are. Am I, am I hearing good. you? Yeah. You're pretty good, yeah. I mean, you want to try to, you want to, you don't want to add your own stuff. You can, you can, uh, I think it's, it's good to, um, to take the meaning that's there, but you don't want to add stuff that wasn't there. Um, so do you want to just reflect back, Aaron, what you just heard Dave say just now? Yeah, you're saying that uh, I pretty much covered it, but steer away from adding other stuff to what I'm reflecting back. Right. Really just. Right, but yeah, that's right. Um, uh, but you don't have to say my words exactly. <laughs> Just make sure that um, it's really what I, I said. Can clearly illustrate that I understand what it is that you're saying, and right. because we can't go forward with the conversation if I I don't. But right. I'm also a blabbermouth. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, you know, I have big hopes for this, these, I, this idea in general. I was at, uh, you know, we went to a talk at, Edwin and I went to a talk at Berkeley where uh, Dere McKesson was there from Black Lives Matter. I had a conversation with him. I'm really, you know, my goal ultimately is to really, our goal is to, you know, to have some, some dialogues that seem, seem significant, either because the players are significant or because the conversation be, becomes significant enough that, um, you know, it gets watched a lot and kind of goes viral and then people realize, wow, this is a cool thing that we can, we can all do, you know? Okay. So what I hear is that you're, um, you feel that there's a lot of potential with this process. Um, you're reaching out to sort of broad swaths of people that seem interested in the process. And you hope that by bringing together a, a broader, um, like I said, sort of broad swath of people that would better reflect the, uh, the, the dialogue itself, that maybe more people will watch it and, and then maybe engage in this type of activity themselves? Let me try again. You didn't get it exactly right. So, I, you know, I'm trying to find people who are significant or create di dialogues where you know, some, some transformation takes place in people's viewpoints that people can then, that, you know, would, that would be seen a lot so that uh, people might learn how to do this themselves and, you know, we could get somewhere with all these problems. Okay, so basically you want to pick sort of, what I'm hearing is you want to pick significant players in their respective roles Okay, and um, for lack of a better term, leadership, because in this, I say lack of a better term, because in our modern climate, leadership is very difficult to find within these groups, but maybe people who can express um, the, uh, the values of their group and do it with a little bit of authority within their group. And then people from maybe the other side who represent that same type of role and can also. Um, Right, so stop. There's sure. You you it's way too much. You're adding you can when it's your turn to talk, you can talk, you can say whatever you want. But you need to reflect back what I said. I mean, you understood what I said. I know you did. I can tell you did. But you said a lot more than what I said. Sure. So, okay, so let's how about you speak. What do you think, Edwin? I can't hear you. I just mean, if you just reflect back what you heard Dave just say, and that'll be the end because it was five minutes. So just that last part that he just said, explaining to you every, that. That um, he can tell that I understood 
his intent, but that um, I just added a lot of information in my in my um, reflect back, or you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't necessary, maybe. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't okay. what I said. It was your your addition. So right. It, you know, you want to get to the core of what I said. You don't have to use my words. You might want to use my significant words. Well, I could. Okay, just just that's your time, Dave. If you just okay. reflect back what you were hearing him say that last piece, that that will that, it'll be your turn then. I'm sorry. Do what? Oh, Dave. Dave. What I heard Dave say was that just he was saying just reflect back. What I was hearing you say, Dave, is just reflect back the core of what it is that you say and don't add anything to it. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, now it's your turn to speak. You've got five minutes, Aaron. You can choose Dave or myself to speak to. Huh. <laughs> uh, I'll flip a coin. Let's see. Okay. I'll, we'll go with Dave. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. So I guess... My first thought is what I'm kind of struggling with is to find the way I think I, for me in the way I, that I personally communicate, it would be better for me to just do my best to repeat your words back to you because what I'm tr attempting to do is take what you said and put it in my own words. So as to show you that I understood and it seems like it's, it's causing me to embellish on it a lot. So I was like, um, Edwin had suggested, you know, you don't have to necessarily just repeat back his words. So, so I'm trying to so hard to try not to just repeat back his words and find my own words that it's causing me to embellish. Okay. And, uh, so yeah, go ahead. Let me reflect that back. So you're thinking that, uh, it would be better perhaps since you are who you are to, uh, just at least for now till you get better at it to practice just uh, reflecting back my words and not to embellish. Yes, precisely. Um, let's see. So I, I have five minutes, so now I can kind of go, okay, so um, I absolutely agree um, that getting significant people from the different sides who have influence in their communities or at least understand their communities well and can represent them well verbally and calmly could do wonders. Um, I, I have been thinking a lot since you and I talked and really over the last year about um, Phil Donahue and um, Geraldo Rivera and all the press and the sit down actual talks that they did that were so controversial in the 80s and early 90s and how so many people I think were really awoken to what the real truth was from the mouths of both opposing sides and were able to then make a better assessment and um, of what was going on then and right now we don't have that right now we have um, the left is adamant at least the extreme left is adamant that you no platform, no dialogue. You're giving a platform to fascism and you can't have it. And while I, I'm sympathetic to that, um, I think it causes them to not fully understand the dynamics of the side that they're opposed to. So I haven't gone about it that way. I've tried to reach out to them and through that process I've found, uh, again, another thing that I agree with you that, um, someone like Joey is approachable, while others aren't. Okay. So I'll stop there. Okay, so uh, you've been thinking a lot, you know, over the past year and since we talked about, uh, I think you said about how, you know, uh, see, you said so much, it was hard for me. <laughs> it's hard for me. You said, uh, I'm, you were thinking about the talks that Geraldo Rivera and Phil Donahue had back in the 80s, which, uh, uh, and how, you know, they kind of were representatives of different points of view, and people were able to uh, watch those shows, and, um, which I don't know really anything about. 
but they were able to watch those shows and get a better understanding of what the two sides point of views were and we don't really have that now yeah um, and that uh you were you know in terms of joe you've been and then you said uh, right then you said that uh right now the left doesn't feel that they you know that the right should have any plat or the far right should have any platform that it's you know it's fascist speech and you want to shut that they should shut it should be shut down that you're sympathetic to it but you don't really g agree with it necessarily in practice and that's not what you've been doing and that you think Joey Gibson is approachable and that was five minutes and he did great <laughs> <laughs> okay so so he was heard in your yeah yeah uh, I'm going to go again back to Aaron, so Aaron gets to practice. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a complex environment now because of the fragmenting of the communications platforms. It's, uh, it's a very difficult, it feels like a very difficult environment for anybody who doesn't have an enormous megaphone to get traction. Um, and that's partly why, you know, ultimately I think it's important that we try and that we do get, you know, leadership people together. They're the ones with the megaphones, basically. Um, and you want to give them a chance to reflect that first? Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what I hear is that um, w we live in a very complex environment. Um, especially with sort of the, um, the way we ingest information, the social media platforms, I think is what you were getting at. That is so fragmented. And, um, and um, so in that environment, it's very hard for, to get a foothold with people. So hopefully reaching out to people with already have a platform within those communities, like Joey, for instance, uh, seems more effective. And um, yeah, I feel heard. That was it. Okay, that was good. You're getting better. Um, um, so you can even reflect back what he just said. <laughs> I, I feel you. You think I'm getting better? Uh, yeah, I did hear that. I I heard that you think I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I I, I appreciate doing this too because. I can, it's cumbersome at first, but I can see how it can whittle down and be a much smoother process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're seeing the benefits of this and how it can, can kind of get, you can get better at it and usefulness. So. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, when I started, I found it really burdensome, actually. And I've gotten used to it and I find I like it. And it's, it's just a good, it, it helps you listen in your, based in your daily life, actually. It makes you realize how much you don't listen, actually, or how much, I, I made me realize how much I don't fully listen, slow down and listen, and I'm thinking about what I'm gonna say when the other person is talking, which you can't do if you're gonna have to reflect back. <laughs> your turn. Uh, yeah, so uh, y you too felt it was, uh, I don't remember. I keep using the word kind of uh, cumbersome. But, uh, I said burdensome. Burdensome, yeah. yeah. And um, but as it, you came to use it more, you get more comfortable, and now you actually like it very much and use it in different aspects of your life, and uh, and yeah. has taught you um, to be more aware of the necessity of listening in general. Right. So. I just wanted to mention one thing that I heard on your, that I thought would be an interesting subject for conversation um, on one of those tapes when you were talking with one of those guys from the right, I can't remember what his name was about immigration. Johnny Benitez. Yeah, Johnny Benitez about immigration. And you were kind of taking the position from the left that, uh, which, 
you know, which I empathize with in terms of its principle, but I think doesn't work politically, which is that, you know, look, these people are suffering and escaping bad circumstances. and They want to come here just like all of our predecessors or you, in fact, in that case, Johnny Benitez came here, but you don't want to let them in. That doesn't seem right. And I was interested in how you think that that is a uh, supportable position politically, basically. So reflect that back to me and then it'll be your turn to talk and you can talk to whoever you want. Okay, so you saw my uh, talk with Johnny Benitez, um, which uh, there was a lot of talk about immigration within our talk. Um, and, and I basically took the position in that talk that- Wait, reflect uh, back what I said. You did say this. Okay, all right. I just want to make uh, sure that that's what you were doing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're saying that I had taken the position that, um, you know, people are suffering, we should let them in, and that um, you're saying that on a sort of maybe moral standard, you can agree with that premise, but in the nuts and bolts of fleshing that out politically in real time, it's um, may not be a, a sustainable position yeah and i wanted to hear more about how how you think that might be a sustainable position it's not <laughs> it's not a sustainable position here's the thing it's okay if you just okay who are you it's uh, who are you speaking to first select who you're speaking to and then oh okay so i guess i would speak to john um uh, because i um okay. hey, edwin. dave or edwin uh, dave uh -huh. sorry uh -huh. i don't know why i said john okay. um uh <laughs> So I, I, I feel compelled to sort of explain what my intent was in even arguing that with him, because really, I didn't want to argue the nuts and bolts of any specific political point, especially not immigration. So my intent really in that conversation was sort of to brush the bulk of that conversation aside, and I was trying to get to a larger uh, topic which was systemic oppression caused by capitalism and and globalization things that i know people like johnny benitez and and um, joey adhere to they're 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 very skeptical of globalization and corporate corruption and what i was trying to ultimately illustrate is that it's those conditions that we live under that have created this environment that i agree is unsustainable it, there's not a way to fix this problem by addressing it from the head on against immigration standpoint. It has to be more of a top down model of things that need to be addressed that would trickle down to that. And that was what I was sort of attempting to get to with Johnny. I never felt that I was very successful in that, in that conversation. Um, I think I, I kind of did a good job of um, poking some holes in his argument but I really wasn't out to defend an argument in relation to immigration per se. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, your intent was not to discuss in any detail immigration poli what immigration policy should or shouldn't be. Uh, you do think that is not a sustainable position, actually, what you were taking, but your intent was was to get to a discussion of, of systemically how, how this is all happening uh, via uh, globalization and corporate corruption that's causing all of this. And you know that guys like Joey and Johnny Benitez are sympathetic to those ideas and that's what you, where you were trying to get to because you feel that, I, I guess you're saying you feel that uh, Immigration, this immigration thing is a consequence. It's not a, it's not a mover of first resort. Yes. I, uh, no, I absolutely feel heard. And I would only clarify by saying that um, um, it's an important issue, but Johnny was treating it. I asked him, I premised it with, what is your big thing? What is the number one most important issue to you? And he went at immigration. So in that moment, it wasn't my intent to shoot down his 
position on immigration. I wanted to shoot down his understanding that that's what's really important. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I may have got hit just maybe by a look in his eye that he got a step closer to maybe questioning that broader. Mm -hmm. so. um, yeah, so you had started the conversation by, by asking him what he thought was the most important thing that was happening. Did I get that right? Yeah, and yeah. he had mentioned him as immigration. So that's when you tried to turn it around into this more systemic argument and you felt that he uh, maybe, you maybe were heard. Yeah. Okay. And I feel heard now. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'll talk to Edwin. So, you know, one of my concerns in these discussions, like when, if, if we, you know, if, if we get Joey and Aaron together, is how we keep these discussions focused in some sense. And we've talked about whether we should have a topic, like I think a really good topic to have with Joey would be freedom. What is the meaning of freedom? Um, because I think that you know, Joey uses that all the word. He has a whole thing about it. And I think the left and the right look at those, the meanings of those things very, very differently. And it would be a really, you know, because I'm worried that if we don't have a topic like that, we just go, we just go, I mean, we'll go, even if we start there, we'll still go all over the place. But it's nice to sort of think, be able to think, you know, whoever the participants are. Well, so. How does this fit back into what we were talking about, which is freedom, mm -hmm. for example? So one concern you have about uh, like doing the empathy circle is that the topics can kind of wander all over and there's not a real clear focus. And you would like to have a, a, a more of a focused topic, like something like freedom. And you're, uh, I'm, I think you're saying that that would be more effective to have a clear uh, focus like that. Uh, yeah, because I feel if we go all over the place, it's hard to make any progress really in any understanding. It's like there's too many things being discussed and we don't go back and forth on anything in particular, you know, and one, I mean, over, it, I mean, the truth is that, you know, to have an hour or two, you can't get very far, but I mean, Ultimately, you know, you could go all over the place and if you did it every week or twice a week, you would get somewhere. But, you know, in these sh shorter things to have some, you know, breakthroughs in understanding of each other's points of view, I feel like I'm not sure. I'm asking in a way. I'm asking mm -hmm. Aaron too, everybody. You know, it feels to me like it would be good to have a well thought, thought through focus that we're always bringing ourselves back to. Something. Mm -hmm. So you're, you have concern about uh, kind of a, more of a diffuse kind of going all over the place and that might not be so effective. And if we were more focused, it's actually a question you're having, uh, we'd like to put out there. Is it, is it uh, better to have a focused discussion to uh, really have to create some breakthroughs? Because you're really wanting to have some sort of a feeling of a breakthrough. Uh, yeah, happen. I'm looking for moments like, oh, I understood something I didn't understand before about, you know, I think most, you know, those of us who pay attention, we know a lot about what the other side thinks, but we don't necessarily know why they think what they think. And, and you know, I think there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding and, um, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying there's a lot of misunderstanding and people don't really understand kind of what's behind what people are saying. And that you would like to have some sort of a, an aha moment where aha, now I understand. And you're, you'd like to find some way of creating those aha moments. Right, right. And really the last, you know, what we, I think, you know, you talk about this and we've talked about this. What we'd ultimately like to get to is, you know, where two end antagonists get to a point well so okay how can we work on something like this problem whatever it is together actually you know from our different vantage points how could we work on this together instead of like fighting each other mm -hmm. because i think it's also like what aaron said i think a lot of the you know the people on the far left on the far right that are going to these rallies 
actually, they have a lot in common, actually. And I, I agree with that. You know, fundamentally, where they stand socioeconomically, they have a lot in common. So you're seeing a lot of commonality between the left and right that are coming to these events. And it sounds like you would like to have some sort of a collaboration happen between them because yeah. there's actually a lot that they have, uh, you know, socially, economically uh, in common with each other. And right. you'd like to see some positive, you know, joint steps or something. Right. I feel hurt. Okay. Um, start the clock here. Track that. So I'll speak to Erin. Uh, uh, something along those lines that I saw in one of your videos uh, was another comment was you had talked about that you'd been at Occupy Wall Street and they said, oh, you should reach out to the conservatives or something, should have. And you said, I did. I reached out to the Tea Party and they gave us the cold shoulder. <laughs> so um, I, was, I really thought that was interesting that you actually did try to uh, reach out exactly like uh, Dave was just talking about. Okay, so you're saying that you um, saw in one of my videos me talking about um, during the Occupy time uh, uh, that we had reached out to Tea Party people and they were not receptive to our reach out, but that you thought that that was uh, interesting that we had made that effort and um, that you feel that that goes very much in line with what uh, Dave has been saying. Yeah. And, and for me, the, uh, the topic is empathy. <laughs> because I, I think we need a culture of empathy that is really the solution uh, for the different sides to relate to each other. Because ultimately, without this basic tool of, of being able to listen to each other and take this empathy as a, a value, everything always just kind of polarizes and you know, kind of can fall apart. So this one question for me is how do we create uh, more empathy more of an empathic connection with each other and the understanding that uh, that comes from that. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that w without empathy, we become totally polarized. We can't have any type of conversation with mm -hmm. each other. And, um, um, sorry, I totally got yeah, distracted. So, oh, so that's the topic I'm looking at is if there's a theme we're looking at, it could be what is the relationship of empathy and other things, you know, if it's empathy and freedom or empathy and any other topic. So for me, I always organize around empathy. We talk about it and then we do it. So what we're actually doing is a process that helps facilitate it. So it's a doing and even talking about it. Okay, so uh, I think I what I heard was that uh, maybe you, were you reflecting on um, what he had said about um, picking kind of a theme. But yeah, uh -huh. that exactly, theme is, exactly. That empathy is related to whatever that ultimate. So for instance, empathy in freedom or empathy. Yeah. And protection or whatever. So for example, yeah. I, I went to the, to, uh, the Republican state convention. It was here in San Jose once. And I said, tell me about your values. And, you know, they immediately, some young Republicans, they said, it's protection. We've got to protect ourselves. You know, if anybody hurts us and our family, we're protection. So I just did empathic listening. I said, okay, you know, protection is important. And, you know, tell me more. And it was like security and safety. And then I turned it around after, after a little while listening to him. And I said, oh, so you're wanting to protect yourself against people who are not empathic. Because if somebody comes and tries to harm your family in your house, they are people who are not being empathic. They're not listening to you. They're not considering, you know, your well-being. So you're really, you know, empathy is kind of what you're wanting to protect yourself against. And he said, yeah, empathy is pretty important, I guess. <laughs> and I said, well, how do we work together to create more empathy uh, in the world? And it, was, it became a really interesting discussion. Okay, so you... you you're telling me about a Republican convention in San Jose where you were talking to someone there who, um, the young Republicans. Uh, oh God. Okay. <laughs> so <the> Republicans. <laughs> um, and, uh, they're 
primary uh, issue that they had expressed was for protection. They want to protect themselves and their loved ones and their family. And through being empathetic, empathetic, and listening to his concerns on that, you were then able to make him understand the importance of being empathetic and listening to others by bringing it home to where he lived in his words and in his uh, and, and relating it, relating it, yeah, relating it to his his value of protection. He's actually protecting himself against people who are unempathic, right? It's like, and he's saying, "Oh, yeah." And then, then the question is, how do we work together to create more empathic people, like the guy that did the shooting in that church? I mean, that's like serious lack of empathy of him for all the people he's like killing. So it's not like more security more whatever it's more how do we create a more empathic society and kind of stop this stuff you know way upstream before it happens yeah you kind of reiterating the importance of empathy and making sure that he understood that it's not just that i have empathy for you but you have empathy for others and that we have empathy for each other mm -hmm. And the more we understand each other, because that's ultimately what empathy is, is relating to and understanding the other person, then, then we're off and running in less conflict. And maybe he saw that potential. Yeah, that's, yeah that, 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 they, there's a lot more to it, but my time is up, so I feel heard. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Your turn, Aaron. Talk oh, it's my turn. Why. Okay. I, I, um, Hmm. Hmm. I guess I, I think what I've been kind of thinking about throughout the conversation was um, you, David, you had expressed um, concern about uh, uh, how this process can become very lengthy and drawn out to where it's over weeks at a time. And, um, and then, um, so I don't know, I, I guess what I agree with that, that I can see that being kind of a problem. Um, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean it was a problem. Just so well, you know. I, no, I like just reflect word. back, Dave. Just, yeah, I don't, okay, just I reflect say, back I didn't, like word, I didn't like that word when I said it either. That, that's, that's not a proper, um, you can just make it more tedious, I guess. And getting to some real meat and so what I'm thinking of I, I guess I'll let you say if you yeah I want you to go ahead and talk back from there there's more I want to say but make sure we're clear here this far I think I interrupted you and I didn't understand so I think you better start again okay okay so what I've been thinking about is that um, maybe sort of how to consolidate this into a more sort of streamlined process, especially if we're going to get to where we've got like, say six people, you know, three from the left and three from the right or something and how to make that functioning. Um, I mean, it's going to need some sort of moderating thing, a, a moderator role, I guess. I, I'm, I'm kind of just thinking out loud. <laughs> um, but because I do like this circle that we're doing and it, it functions great for like three people, but the broader this circle gets, it's going to be so hard because how do you make sure that everybody on the panel, does each person on the panel have to then reflect back that they heard right? Because anyway. So you're, you're, you're thinking about what it would be like to have a larger group uh, and you're feeling like it's how does that work that maybe we would need a moderator um, and does each person have to reflect back everything that they heard and uh, you're just thinking you're just imagine trying to imagine what this process would be like with more people yeah, no, I, I feel heard. And, and then I would only add to it that um, the reason I asked a question is about would everyone have to um, sort of report back? Um, because you kind of need to make sure, I guess, that everybody did properly hear. Because 
let's say Dave and I, you're having a, are having a conversation and you're, re you're, you're recording back wonderfully and showing that you've heard me just fine. That doesn't guarantee that Edwin did. You see what I'm saying? Or, and then if there's three other people in the room, how do, how can I guarantee that they properly, how can I be confident that they understood where I was coming from when I expressed something without each one of them doing, doing that process? So I, I'm not necessarily like, um, trying to find fault in the process, just trying to maybe address possible problems before they arise, I guess. I don't know. Because right. I, I do want to see this become a much larger thing. So. Right. So you're, you're just, you're wondering how does one know if the, 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 the observers understood in a larger process? Um, and you're just wondering what that, whether that's a problem or not. And, uh, you can imagine, you would like to see this become a larger thing that more and more people are doing. So you're just wondering about that. Yeah. Is it something that's been considered because I, I, from what I'm hearing, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about the history of Empathy Tan. I've learned a lot tonight that you started, that started in the last two weeks of um, Occupy. It sounds to me like it was sort of a, hey, let's just go do this and we'll learn as we go. and you have learned a lot as you've gone and is it still in that process? Is it still in a sort of, does it have room to grow and be kind of redefined? Not that I would want to redefine it, but mm -hmm. yeah. So, so you're just wondering w where we're at in terms of refinement of this process. Um, yeah. Sounds like, yeah. And still is, is it still being refined? Is it, is, it, is it a process? Is it still being refined? Yeah. Well, so. Yeah, that was uh, five minutes. Good? Yeah, it was five minutes. So it's also okay. your turn now, Dave. So, look, Edwin can answer some of this better than me, but what I would say is that. Who are you speaking to, Dave? I'm speaking back to Aaron. Okay. Is that, uh, you know, we do it with a lot of people. One of the things that you, you, you're probably noticing, but you notice it even more with more people, is it slows down even more, which, you know, at first feels like a burden. But when you get used to it, what you realize is that it sucks everybody into the same space, that everybody's really listening. And, you know, it drops everybody into kind of a different, place than a normal room with six people in it, you know, talking at the same time and cross talking and all that stuff that usually goes on, doesn't go on. And everybody gets sort of sunk into this same space. And I don't know, my experience isn't doesn't really matter whether the, you know, what matters is that the speaker and the listener have understood each other. You know, I, we can't have everybody reflect. Sometimes what Edwin would do is Edwin would reflect back, is the moderator might re reflect back for everybody what each person says. So I'll let you go ahead now. You're saying that um, in your experience in having done this before, um, first you, you, you validated that you can see why I would see it being kind of a weighted down process. And, um, but you related that in your experience that really um, the sort of people standing around or watching and they, they, everyone kind of gets sucked into it and everyone really kind of gets hyper focused on what's going on. They actually do pay attention and that yes, while it might kind of slow the process down a little bit, people aren't really getting lost They're They actually are listening and hearing and paying attention to it. And, um, and then you, mentioned about how Edwin could do, uh, mentioned how Edwin maybe could do, uh, he could serve that role of being, all right, he could do the, the re I keep calling it report back, but that's not what you guys call reflect it. Reflect back. Reflect back. Um, that he could maybe do that as a sort of moderating role. Right. I mean, yeah, not that maybe, I mean, there's different ways, you know, that he does this, that we do this. Um, 
you know, the, everything we're doing is being reiterated all the time. Nothing is final. I mean, I don't, but you know, there's, you know, Edwin's done a lot of this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, five or six people, it works fine actually. So. Okay. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're saying that you, with five or six people in, in the amount of how often they've done this and under different circumstances, it works. Right. So I just wanted to clarify one other thing that I meant before, which is that, I mean, I imagine the way this would work the best is, you know, you and Joey and whoever else get together and we do it and we do it every week or every two weeks for a while. So we really get somewhere, you know, it builds into something of, you know, understanding between each other and, and, you know, if everybody's enjoying it and it feels meaningful to people, you know, it's not just something we just do once because, you know, you just get started. So, yeah, you're saying that it's something that should become a, almost a trend. Um, it's not just once because we won't be able to cover everything once. And um, maybe even something that people want to do more regularly and kind of come to look forward to doing because of ground that's being made. Right. I feel hurt. Your turn. Speak to. Oh, it is my turn. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so, and who are you, who are you speaking to? I, I, who are you speaking to? Uh, I guess I'll talk to Edwin. Okay. Um, I was thinking of the um, the uh, Frost Nixon tapes. <laughs> it's a. Um, a series of talks um, I think would be a very good way to sort of uh, promote it or, or to push it. There's a series of talks that we're doing. This is going to be the first in the series. And then, yeah, I, and, I, and I would like to echo what um, uh, the idea that, yes, pick a theme, but maybe each of these different days, it's empathy and freedom, then it's empathy in you know, whatever immigration or whatever topic is picked and um, but really frame it from the beginning as a series of talks. I, I just, I like that idea a lot. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of ideas and creativity. You have a, like a sense of creativity of ideas of how to kind of uh, build on the process. And, and one of these ideas is, uh, Oh, this could maybe be structured as a series. And that would, uh, It'd be empathy and freedom, empathy and something. So it'd be a whole topic. And so you're kind of looking for ways of using this, maybe for effectiveness or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh -huh. and to, yes, I feel heard. And then I would only add to that to, um, to give those that would be viewing it the sense that we're working towards a larger goal. Mm, it's not mm -hmm. just, hey, check out the first one. It's mm, cool. It's no, no, no. Mm. This is a larger process, and we're going to build something that's going to ultimately end in something larger. Stick with us. And yes, I feel very much heard in that I'm expressive. I'm a show promoter. I have been for 25 years. I book elaborate events, costumed events, and themed events. But this is how I think. Is mm -hmm. it so? I guess the last thing I would say before I let you uh, uh, report back <laughs> is that uh, don't <laughs> let me get ahead of your process. I can do that. I, I'm a mm -hmm. real kind of run the show guy and have been for a long time. So, okay, so you're kind of giving a warning that don't let don't let us let you get take the process and run kind of run off with it because that's kind of your personality. And there's actually a sense of humor. You're feeling a bit of humor uh, uh, about that and. And um, so the other part is that uh, the, you're, you're thinking, I'm hearing you're thinking in terms of how to engage people in this. And if they see that there's a longer journey to it, a whole series, that there'll be more interest in kind of getting involved to take this whole journey uh, here versus this is just one circle and that's the end. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and then, and also that, um, which I haven't expressed yet, but... This, this idea of do not engage the right. There's under so many circumstances that I do agree with that. I think that the vast majority of the people on the left probably should not be engaging these far right people. I think that they don't know what to say. I think they don't know much about them. And 
they generally just come out calling them Nazis and names and, and then get mad at them for sort of doing the same thing to us because many people on the right, they just call us faggot and cuck and accuse us of murdering 900 million people and there's no dialogue there. And so I think a lot of people on the left understand that that's the dynamic and have said, just don't talk mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that for a lot of people, but there are people on, and um, who should try. And maybe it's a little arrogant of me to think I'm one of those people, okay? Because now I'm basically asserting that I'm kind of special and I'm <laughs> better than them, okay? Uh -huh. but, but I do feel, I hearken back, I don't know, Edwin, if you remember the Nazi skinheads on Geraldo and, and, and especially on Donahue. Donahue had breakthroughs. Geraldo just got his nose broken and made a mockery. But people did see at that point they were on the fence with how to feel about Nazi skinheads and when they saw him break Geraldo's nose they went mm, that's what they are it was kind of a Charlottesville moment <laughs> for America then and so I would like to engage that process with sympathy and understanding and respect for those on the left who adamantly feel we should never engage. I don't want to disrespect them for having taken that position. Mm, mm -hmm. Frankly, I would probably, I have to sort of protect my own reputation in my, I'm an anarchist and my, my podcast appeals very much to the anarchist community and they are very adamant. You don't do this. Right. So you guys seem what the, the structure that you're building seems to give me an opportunity to try this out and do this and show my anarchist community there can be there can be some situations under which we should do this and it could even be beneficial to us mm -hmm. okay so you're you're there's uh on the left a lot of the left doesn't want to talk with the right and you're saying that i'm hearing you say that part of that is they don't know how to talk with the right. If they were to even try, it would just you know blow up or you know turn be negative. So you have you want to have real understanding for that, and you know not you know put it down or something like that, but really have a deeper understanding for that for that experience. But you're saying that some people, uh, and you you included, actually can talk with with the right without things maybe blowing up, but because. You've got the skills or the temperament uh, to do that. And then what we're actually doing here with the Empathy Tent, we're sort of giving a model or a space for people like yourself to actually do that engagement with the right. And it sounds like maybe some gratitude for that or, or seeing, an seeing an opportunity in that. Yeah, I feel hurt. I would only clarify one little bit as far as... Um when I said that um, people on the left don't know how to communicate with the right, that is a part of it. And it's both sides. Many, m many people on the right don't know how to communicate with people on the left. But they're also like so much of this is going on. I didn't say this initially, but this should clarify a little bit. Um, so much of what of these dialogues are going on at rallies, which are really just such a, a terrible environment to try and have a dialogue. Everyone's just yelling at each other and super heated up and passionate about whatever it is their thing <laughs> their our you know whatever my speech is whatever my dialogue is i go to that march ready to pound that home and they came ready to pound home their side so that environment is not conducive to dialogue at all mm -hmm. and 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 that environment is is all we're seeing of our modern examples of the, a dialogue between the left and right at all is no they're just screaming and yelling at each other at rallies that's the dialogue and so <laughs> i i have respect for people who say don't engage that don't be a part of that and then i would also add to it that i know a lot of people on the left are very concerned and i've seen evidence of this that they, <laughs> they will engage people um more, more the more nefarious characters on the right who are filming them and then they take that video go back and they edit it all up to shit and make it look like this leftist said this or said that when they really didn't and really do a missed dishonest uh, representation of their words so out of protection they're saying do not do not do not right so i understand that there's it's it's not as simple as they don't understand the alt-right 
That's one element of some of them. There's some of whom will understand them very well, right? I guess I just, I want to show, I want to make sure that I'm expressing proper respect for the, the myriad of reasons why they have reached this conclusion, do not engage. Okay. And I would like them to see that in some instances, there might be a case where it's okay. Mm -hmm. But you're right to have made that conclusion for you and for the community in a broader sense. But can we please just carve out a little niche where we try it? Okay, so you really want to show that you, you really want to show your understanding for a whole myriad of reasons of why people don't want to uh, interact with the, the right. One being that in these rallies, it's a very contentious environment and it's not very conducive to dialogue in the first place. And there's also that at these rallies, you know, that they might be videotaping and then totally distorting the message. And, uh, you know, so there's a whole myriad of, of reasons and that you really want to show that you have understanding for that, oh, that whole myriad of reasons. But you want to say that there could be, you know, one little area where uh, dialogue is okay and could be helpful or beneficial in some way. So kind of have that full spectrum, share that full spectrum. And that was five minutes too. <laughs> okay. So look, it's nine, it's five past nine. Yeah. So how are you with time? We can go a little bit longer or do you feel sick? To I feel good. I feel like this is much better. Um, I feel like I have a better understanding of the process for sure. And, um, I mean, I've got some things I got to do. I actually just noticed out of the corner of my eye, Jesus Christ just subscribed to my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we can close it, close it now. And uh, sounds like you have uh, something you'd like to close with, Dave. No, no, I guess we'll close the recording and then talk oh. about what we're going to do. Okay. Do? Yeah, so we can all uh, stop the recording. And and I can get a copy of this recording. Uh, it's, we'll put it on YouTube. So okay. Stop recording.